Hi guys, how are you? Mine this one, Titanium. Welcome back to Rio Macro Economics and Investing. Patreon.com slash Rio Macro. Patreon.com slash Rio Macro. Don't forget to come down and subscribe. Three different packages to choose from. All right. So, what's going on in the markets? Uh, let's go back. This is not the one that I want. Uh, one second. This is the one I want. Okay. So, uh, this is... Um, the Nasdaq and this is during trading hours and you can see there were initially there was so many gap ups and gap ups and gap ups and, and so forth uh, and that uh, has dissipated except for the one little gap right in here that has not been filled uh, just took off and off it went into uh, La La Land and we have crossed the all-time highs set back prior to COVID and we continue in this rising F flag and we got into this head and shoulders in here. And now, you know, we broke down initially. And I thought it was going to come all the way down here. And that didn't work out. Right? So I thought it was going to do uh, kind of one, two, three down here and then start building back up. Uh, that's not what happened. So uh, now what? Well, we're back up above the trend line. Uh, and that doesn't necessarily mean that it's uh, it's bullish. Uh, so if you're a bear, uh, you always get those uh, head tests, right? It comes up, double tops, head test, and then comes back down again. Uh, so long as you are within this uh, rising F flag. Now, short term, uh, the bias is to the upside, okay? Except for one thing, that the 63-day moving average is acting as resistance right now. We went above it, came back down. Uh, let's see if we can get above and hold above the 63-day moving average. Now, why 63 days? It's a quarter worth of trading, and it's where money managers, uh, you know, their appetite to, to purchase stocks uh, can be viewed in price. If it's above it, then it's nice and bullish. Everything looks great. If it's below it, then you start getting a little bit worried. So when you start to flatten out the 63-day moving average, starts to act as resistance then you start to you know wonder what is going on um so we're back up above the the uh neckline we're building a little bit of pressure in here now let's see what happens now for the bears i said that the market needs to be ready uh to drop and this could could be such an event where you will see price decline over a, a period of months you will get the lower highs you will get the volatility of back and forth uh, and then eventually it starts to um, to wither away so let me show you two examples of that the first one back in 2000 right you got that m pattern is what i call it okay and then it starts to wither away so you get this volatility where it looks like it's going to fall apart then it does and then it pops then it kind of you know uh, by the dippers are always there same thing in uh, 2008 okay it was having that kind of uh same uh you know i'm trying to go back up i'm trying to go back up this is a bull flag it's going to break out and instead it, it starts to fall apart so these kind of structures uh, head and pattern uh, head and shoulders pattern m patterns uh, do occur at tops so can we say it's kind of the same deal here with the head and shoulders you know that it starts to to kind of go sideways and then starts to you know fall apart uh, that's possible that's possible although you know it hasn't happened in uh, and <laughs> We had literally we had 33 day, day bear market where the market dropped more than 20 percent uh down to 35 percent and it literally just lasted 33 days which is historic it's never happened before now uh, another thing to to kind of take into consideration is time right we always want to know about time well it, it took about uh, 219 days before the market started to uh, fall apart back in 2000 so it's about a year right uh, and, and the same thing back in 2008 um, where we'll, we'll start always from the top okay uh, it, it took about 317 so it takes about nine months to a year before the market is ready to start to go down 
so that's counting from the top. So, you know, if we're going to look for any kind of, you know, uh, disaster, okay, it's going to be in November 2021. <laughs> it's going to be some, you know, it's going to take some time. It's going to take some time. Uh, it doesn't mean that we cannot have uh, a 20 plus percent correction. You know, we had one back here, for example, uh, in uh, 2018, and it took about 85 days. You, ha you, ha you get some of these pullbacks, but those pullbacks typically don't last. Now, in in my in my case here, this drop, uh, I was not expecting this at all. This is a first time event when you go back and study these charts. Uh, again. Uh, how much do I attribute that to the Fed and uh, endless uh, deficits and so forth? Literally, you can see from top to bottom, it was 32 days. And then the bottom of the start going up. Uh, how much is that is the deficits, Fed, and, uh, endless lending programs and so forth? You know, to me, it, it, it blew my mind away. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Uh, and, and I wonder how much of that has to do with the market not being ready to to go down yeah you know, it makes me wonder uh i'm sure there's a percentage of it that 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 applies so uh again when you start seeing these head and shoulders patterns um at least for the nasdaq we're going to say that you know it's getting tired now if i take you to dow jones going all the way all the way back to 1897 <laughs> Right, we are in a very, very long-term, uh, 88 year, whatever, resistance area, um, and that does not look bearish. Uh, I don't think anybody can argue that, right? It, it looks bullish as hell. Um, uh, don't mind the the red. Anyway, let, let me change this real quick. Right, so here's a 63-day moving average in the Dow, and these are considered value plays right it's not a tesla it's not an amazon it's not a google uh and and it's uh it's been behaving very well uh up against the uh, 63 day moving average it touched it a couple of times it continues to push higher and and that that has been the theme i guess since november where value uh now is the shit right it's the coolest uh, thing since sliced bread uh, and if you compare that to, um, let's say, like ARC, okay, uh, SPAC, okay, um, IPO, okay, they're, they're all suffering. They're all going through a correction. Um, if you look at the, uh, the FANGs, as I call them, or the FAGs, I call them, okay, they've been in a, in a rising kind of wedgy-looking formation. They're struggling with that 63-day moving average. Uh, I have to fix it now. I kind of leave that here just because I don't need that 63-day on there. Uh, so I can have a point of reference. But it's been going sideways. It tried to break out this week. Didn't do a good job. Came back down. Uh, building some pressure down here uh, against this wedge. Uh, I'm, I'm, you know, It's definitely tired as opposed to value, which is Dow Jones. And that's doing really, really good. Um, you look at the equal weighted S&P and that's kicking ass all over the place. You look at dividend weighted S&P kicking ass all over the place. So clearly, uh, the NASDAQ has a pause. It's got a, you know, a bearish structure in there that has been negated and you watch the rest of the, of the market and it's really, really doing, um, fantastic. Uh, so now what does that mean? Well, it means if you have a 401k, uh, you know, you, you've been un underperforming for a year, if not longer. And uh, and that was one of my arguments. Everybody's like, oh, the stock market is up. Yeah, stock market is up, <laughs> but the broader market is not up because it's only those six, seven stocks that are really outperforming the fangs, um, not the broader market. Well, now that's not the case. Now it's the reverse where... The high flyers are not doing as well, and the broader market is. Uh, you look at the New York Stock Exchange, that's, that's doing fine. Um, uh, show you a couple other things. 
Uh, you look at SVX, uh, which is value, S&P 500 value, right? That's all-time highs, breaking out, looking really good, way above the 63-day moving average. And then you take a look at uh, financials, and they're uh, now, again, at uh, all-time highs, XLF, okay? Again, they um, they were finding that double top right up against here. They got a, had a correction, came back up, tested, small little pullback, and then off it went. So that's that's doing really good, right? They are funded by f the Fed, so nothing too big to fail, blah blah blah, all that stuff. They got all the the value uh, in in there going for them. Now let me pause here for a second, and I want you to listen. Uh, someone explain Minsky. Uh, he's a lot more articulate than I am. Again, I'm not a TV personality, but. Um, I think it's important that people listen to this financialization that Minsky saw back in the 80s. So let's get started with that. Because the emphasis on increasing growth and increasing investments would lead to this natural result of investments growing more rapidly than the ability of those investments to produce the debt service and to keep the economy stable. So this was basically his position up until around the uh, the period of the 1980s. In the 1980s, things in the U.S. changed, and they changed relatively rapidly. They changed in a couple of different ways. The first way was the banks were no longer really interested in financing the acquisition of capital assets by firms. At the same time, Firms no longer came very interested in producing income by purchasing capital assets. And both of these sectors entered into what came to be called financial engineering. Financial engineering meant what? Well, if you look from the point of view of, of firms, if you were the chief financial officer of the firm, instead of looking to find funding to buy capital assets, you now looked at the ways in which you could produce financial assets, not real assets, financial assets in order to create income so that firms became concentrated on using the issuance of financial assets and the discrepancy in financial asset prices simply to generate incomes by trading financial assets. Now, there's a very big difference between financing investments to produce real output and issuing financial assets simply in order to generate gains from basically what is mispricing in financial market. Now, banks started doing the same thing. That is, banks started looking at the ability to create income by looking at mispricing in terms of financial asset. This is what we call the difference between financing to get a gain on a price differential and financing in order to produce income that comes from operating a, say, a printing press or an automobile factory. And what Minsky noted was that from the 1980s onwards, increasingly the financial system was concentrating on simply pricing differentials. Some people eventually called this financialization, but basically Minsky talked about this as money manager capitalism. Why? Because he said it now came to be the case that instead of managing assets in order to assess the profitability of real investments, that is, instead of looking at General Motors and saying, does General Motors produce an automobile that is able to generate profits, and are those profits sufficient to cover the costs of financing, that is, the debt service of those liabilities, now the bankers are simply looking at the liabilities that General Motors issues and whether they can trade those liabilities in order to make a profit amongst themselves. And this basically became what he called money manager capitalism. He said what happened is that money managers now would generate portfolios and they would manage those portfolios not in terms of the income that the portfolios generated, that is, we're talking about the income from sales of output, but generated income from their ability to trade those assets in order to take advantage of pricing differentials. So. All right. 
So you get what he's saying, right? Minsky was way, 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 way ahead of his time. And this has gotten so unbelievably bad that people actually believe that what is going on right now uh, is normal. And it's not. It's not normal. It's not going to be normal. <laughs> uh, people will disagree with me, and that's fine. I, I uh, you know, whatever they want to do. So government is creating money. Uh, the Fed is QEing, right? It's funding government. And this is what we're talking about. This is what he's talking about. He's saying creating um, capital for investment in the productive economy, okay, to, to create real wealth. Uh, so they've gotten away fr from that, and they're just looking at, you know, the stock market, bonds, commodities, real estate, price differentials. And that's all fed by government deficits and QE. This is not the same as it was in 2008. 2008, I understand. You had to keep the interest rates low. The, there was many other problems, but it was more interbank than it was in the real economy. Not that the real economy did not suffer from it. Of course it did. But um, this is far different. Okay. So in the productive economy, even if you put money in, you're like, well, I'm giving stimulus checks for the people and I'm doing the morally right thing. And that's the way it's always going to be presented. Uh, you know, if, if I want to sell you something, I'm going to sell you something and talking about uh, kids starving and whatever. Uh, and that's why I'm doing it. So here's $1,400 for you. But, you know, companies like Boeing are going to get billions and billions and, <laughs> you know, <laughs> Th that, that just kind of slips by everybody because they don't understand what's going on. So um, what happens when you pump money into the productive economy? Well, uh, think about, you know, what you're paying. You're paying to Comcast, you're paying to Verizon, you're paying to whatever, AT&T and Apple and whatever. So that that becomes household income the savings, right? And I've talked about this many times. And then that becomes profit savings for the top 5%. And then all that money gets pumped into uh, asset prices. And that's why I am not uh, in this, uh, oh, reflation trade, blah, 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 that garbage. Uh, because no matter how much money you pump into the productive economy, it's going to end up in the savings bubble. And the savings bubble is deflationary. Just like exports are deflationary. You're, you're, you're importing goods and services, but you're exporting dollars to the rest of the world. That's deflationary as well. Um, so where's 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 the focus of J.P. Morgan, BlackRock, and everything? Yeah, everything is right here, right? To create an income from um, mispricing of assets. That's that's where they're focused on. They're not trying to figure out uh, if General Motors is going to create a car that's going to create a, a profit, and the debt that General Motors acquired is going to be able to be repaid. They don't. They're not concerned with that, right? So. Um, you know, again, taking Boeing, for example, do you have enough money to make next month's payment against your debt? Answer is yes. Then you should buy the stock. That's the logic that we've gotten to. That's the logic we've gotten to. And I said a year ago that once you start to give helicopter money to the people, it's not going to stop. It's going to continue, okay, and and it's going to become a norm. And now we're going to continue to do this until September. Now let's go back and let's look at GDP in real terms. Inflation adjusted is real, okay. And you'll see that at the at the top in 2008, GDP was real GDP. Inflation adjusted was about let's say 15.5 trillion dollars. Okay, you know what the debt was back then? Ten trillion. So let's fast forward to today. And I'm going to take the top. I'm not even going to take the bottom. Well, to pre-COVID, and it was 19.2 trillion. Let's call it 19.5. Okay. So we've literally added four trillion of GDP, and uh, the deficit has increased by 20 trillion or 18 trillion okay that is horrendous 
you are getting less and less GDP growth per dollar. And if you take it to today, where it is today, right, well, let's say Q4, it was 18.7. So we've gotten about 16 cents of GDP for every dollar created. So tax cuts, uh, deficits, QE, all this stuff has done nothing to really grow the economy. Nothing. It's garbage. We're getting less and less and less and less GDP. That is that is not a path that we want to be uh, on right now. And that's why I say we are running in the dark as fast as we can towards a cliff. Does that mean that we're going to hyperinflate, blah, blah, blah? No, that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that we're going towards a, a very stagnated economy. Uh, it's going to take a very long time for people to find jobs. I know everybody's uh, like, oh, my God, that's so wonderful. Never bet against America. I love America. And we're the greatest and we're the whatever. Yeah, but, you know, for the past uh, 11 years, we've managed to get uh, barely $3 trillion worth of GDP, 3.5, whatever, uh, for $18 trillion of public debt. And that's even with a population growth of 30 million, or about 10%. If you go back to 2008, seven, let's say eight, it was 304 uh, million Americans, and today it's 328. For 2019, say it's 330 plus, right? So we added 10% population. We've added uh, 18 trillion dollars in uh, in debt, and we've gotten 4 trillion of GDP growth. So you know. When, when you look at the uh, XLF and they're like, oh, my God, look, you know, it's value, it's value, it's, you know, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> the last thing on this planet that XLF is, is value. But relative to Tesla, uh, I guess it is value. Um, now, if you look at the uh, la U.S. labor force particip participation rate, uh, we have come down substantially, right? We're 61.4. And we used to be back in 2000 up to 67 plus you take a look at the u.s employment popula population ratio it's down to 57.6 and it was um, as high as 64 plus right and it's been falling since 2000 so this is where the you know financialization really starts to kick in right uh that we're getting less and less gdp for each uh, additional dollar created so, you know, again, we, we talk about this MMT stuff all the time. I'm always bitching about it uh, because it, it's led people to believe that, oh, you know, there's uh, there's a magic money tree somewhere and we can just print and everything will be okay. But if you understood economics and you understood that, you know, you're not getting that productive output that you should be getting, um, relative to the amount of money that we are printing, and we're only it's only getting worse, right, because now we're doing helicopter money forever, uh, then you start to realize that we're definitely not headed in the right direction. So while helicopter money is good and it's moral and it's so forth, I'm, I'm, I'm not against it. <laughs> That's not the problem. The problem is that the continuation of that, the moral hazard of that, and the endless of hundreds of billions of dollars going to companies that you know should be going bankrupt and um you know uh, 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 that's why we have bankruptcy laws so if you don't allow prices to kind of correct and there's some self you know price discovery somewhere uh then you're going to end up in a situation where you know you're trying to be uh, as prudent as possible keep everything as uh, stable as possible uh, so stability is inherently destabilizing, where the shit is going to hit the fan at some point. So now as everybody, everybody's crying about the interest rates rising and interest rates rising and interest rates rising. Well, the Congressional Budget Office um, has projected for the next several years uh, the 10-year being around 1.5. And now we're above that 1.5 threshold. Um, so the Fed is kind of chilling and saying, ah, you know, it's no big deal, it's okay. It's because the economy is recovering and that's why inflation is arising and blah, blah, blah. Well, <laughs> we'll see how, how that goes. Again, I'm not in the inflation uh, camp, okay? I don't think you can have inflation because I explained to you that, you know, uh, deficits going 
through the productive economy, household the savings becomes profit savings, and then it ends up in savings uh, bubble, stocks, bonds, commodities, real estate, and then you're importing your ass off, so you're exporting dollars to the rest of the world. How is that inflationary? It cannot be. It cannot be. Okay. Um, so, again, God forbid if every you know if everybody started to really panic sell um, the bonds, and QE comes in, and you know they do Operation Twist or they increase their uh, purchasing. Of um, of assets or whatever the case may be, you know, and that doesn't work. Well, now what? <laughs> you got nothing left. It's done. Uh, as far as I can tell, I, I don't know. Maybe they have something else up their sleeve, but nothing that I'm aware of. So if if that doesn't work, and everybody, you know, the more they QE, the more they panic sell. Um, you end up in a very very bad situation. That's what I call the snap moment that's when everything goes to hell now is that gonna happen i don't think so i don't think that's i don't think that's the case and here's why the ecb came out and says that we're going to increase uh purchasing of assets more qe look what happened to the 10-year everybody front run it went from 0.66 all the way down to 0.59 we're, we're talking about in minutes that happened so imagine if the if the Fed comes out tomorrow and says, oh, we're doing Operation Twist or we're increasing purchases. Same exact thing would happen to the 10-year. Everybody would front run and they would buy up bonds like there's no tomorrow. And prices would rise and then the interest rate would naturally fall. So that's why I don't think that's going to happen. But it's not out of the realm of, of possibility. So if there's anything I learned from the savings bubble, even though I knew about the savings bubble, I never... Uh, anticipated that there would be a 33-day recession in the middle of, of, of a pandemic and economic depression. I didn't. And that's a learning lesson. So, you know, <laughs> uh, I'll take the snap uh, uh, the, the snap point a little bit more seriously than I did the savings bubble. Anyway, so financialization is where we're at. So as long as you can make next month's payment doesn't matter how loaded up with debt you are that stock is a great buy and that's the world that we live in unfortunately or fortunately or whatever you know your point of view is so um, interest rates are rising 6.2 uh, 1.623 it, it, it got uh, a little bit higher than that okay so it is continuing to rise. I think we can go as high as uh, about 3%, okay, on the high end. I think that's possible. Uh, you take a look at commodities. Commodities have been kicking ass all over the place. Right? And this is what I'm talking about, asset price inflation. Uh, this is not what I was looking for. All right, here we go. Uh, so commodities have been on a fucking tear, right, straight up. Uh, and it's up against this resistance area, as I posted. And if you're not following me on TradingView, you should. Um, so it's up against this resistance area. And what I'm thinking is probably going to happen is it'll, it'll start to pause here or correct. And then that, that should tame down uh, interest rates here a little bit. Um, I could be wrong, of course. And uh, this plows right through and breaks out of this big structure that's been in place now for about 11 years. Um, and I think eventually this will... Um, this is going to break out eventually and then you're going to start having uh, asset price inflation so the, the new thing that's going to uh, I keep saying that's going to people are going to start bitching about it's going to be that they're going to go to the supermarket and they're going to look at their bills they're going to say you spend you know x amount of dollars and now it's you know 10 20 30 percent more what's going on inflation blah 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 and that's because agriculture has broken out it's broken out at the end of 2020, and it's been on a tear. Um, so, you know, be ready for that. Be ready for people to start bitching about supermarket. Uh, it's up 34% since uh, the low set uh, in January 2020. Now, this kind of inflation, that I'm not, uh, I am all for. This is likely to pan out. 
Uh, it doesn't mean total inflation. Remember, there's always parts of the economy that are deflationary and then parts of the economy that are inflationary. And, uh, and I think in this area, you'll probably get a lot more inflation for sure in commodities. Okay. Now, if interest rates keep rising, um, you're, you you want to own an asset like a bond that's going to give you, let's say, 2% versus a commodity that's going to give you nothing. Right? Uh, so... You know, it starts to put pressure on gold. It starts to put pressure on these commodities as interest rates continue to rise. So let's see how this is going to work out. Because remember, the inflation that is going on now is monetary inflation. Uh, and it's money flows flowing out of certain asset classes into un another asset classes. So, for example, they're selling bonds and they're buying, uh, or they're, they were selling, um, yeah, bonds and they're buying commodities. And, and, and you know, at some point, bonds are going to become more attractive now commodities they're very very small um so if you put a little bit of money inside the commodities you're going to see price start to rise quickly okay you don't need it's not nearly as big as a bond market which is mammoth so so think of it like this that you know when we started this i guess uh it was what 22 trillion dollars of public debt and then we less a little over a year now we're up to 28 so it's about what uh, uh six trillion dollars we pumped into the economy not counting the lending facilities and all that stuff um so what happened is that all the money started flowing into stocks and the bonds right real estate right a lot of this has to do because it's such low supply and so forth eventually it made its way into commodities all the money being pumped right remember deficits end up in asset prices and then you started to see the commodities started to rise so now the bond market is starting to sell off uh and you know when you sell bonds interest rates rise okay so now the these two are competing to see uh which one is going to win and what is the fed going to do uh, relative to that and we're gonna we're gonna see what they're gonna do because they're saying they're not gonna do anything about it all right so you look at sugar sugar is trying to break out you look at corn Right, that's breaking out. Uh, wheat is breaking out. Soybean is kicking ass. Okay, now let's talk about Bitcoin. Because Bitcoin, uh, you know, uh, again, if you go back and watch my old videos, I was telling you back in the summer of 2018, I was in the beach in Greece, and I'm like, you want to be buying Bitcoin below $5,500. Okay, and that's here. Sorry. Okay, uh, you want to be it went as low as three thousand, right? And then since then, uh, it, it's gotten up to sixty. And now the next target is going to be somewhere, you know, eighty, then a hundred, and whatever. And everybody's like, "Oh, it's got no value." It's got okay. I understand initially it didn't have value. I understand that it was not something uh, accepted by Tesla and PayPal and banks. And uh, you can go. I, I was in Ukraine, for example, and I can go up to. Uh, uh, currency exchange place and they had Bitcoin. I can exchange Bitcoin for the local currency. So what's happening now, in my view, is that we are going into a dual parallel global currency. Um, and let me let me talk a little bit about that. You see, in economics, you are taught that savings freezes up money. There's no circulation and it kills the economy, which is true. The problem is that who is the one that's doing the saving matters, right? And it's not the 95%. So that's problematic because you're depending only on the 95% to, to grow the economy while the 5% are all hoarding. Well, you, you know, it doesn't, the mathematics doesn't work out. There's a certain desire uh, even though it's you know taboo to talk about savings, savings is bad. But poof, you know, savings kills economies. So naturally, they say, well, debt is far better than savings. We we much prefer to have debt than we prefer to have savings. And I think that's true to a certain extent. But at some point, savings matters. Um, holding an asset, uh, there's a desire, a great desire, I would say. Um, to have a currency that does not devalue over time. Now, there's a greater, you know, desire that a currency doesn't, you know, collapse uh, 60% in 30 minutes, 
Right. So that's that's the problem with Bitcoin. But the reason that's happening is because it's still in its infancy stage. It's it's one trillion right now as we speak. In order for Bitcoin to stabilize as a normal currency, you would have to see it above ten trillion, which is about ten times more than whatever the price is today. Right. So there's when people say, well, there's no value. Uh, I, I disagree now. Uh, I used to call it Bitcoin, right? It was a big con. Uh, but I don't think the same today. When the facts change, so do I. Uh, I am still in the camp by myself <laughs> that we are in a dual currency global system. And Bitcoin is, is the other currency. And in order for that currency to, again, stabilize with the volatility, you have to grow the market cap substantially at least if not more 10 trillion now if you go back in time and you look at this you know big crash here right that was mainly due to hyperinflation of coins everybody and their mom was creating coins and um, it had to work its way through and people had to figure out okay well which one of these uh, coins is going to survive and you know we had to go through all of that then then you subdivided it to infinity that you don't have to own one bitcoin you can own a fraction of a fraction of a fraction of a coin and that it had to work its way through that as well now we figured out that hey you know bitcoin is the one that we want to own this is the one that we want to you know uh, we all voted for with our money and it's taken off and it's it's in a it's in a tear now doesn't mean that you're not going to have a correction. I, I had uh, a possible correction coming in here. Right, right, right in here. Okay, that we were possibly going to to do something like this. Okay, and then start to correct and then go back up. But that's, that's not what's happening. We clearly made a, a higher high and it's quite impressive. Uh, so the, the wedge continues. The wedge continues. The price still you know it's going to go higher uh so again there's a strong desire for a currency that cannot be uh, manipulated in terms of expansion uh that people want to save in uh, speculate in what you know initially it's going to be speculation of course uh, because of the volatility but over time it will become more and more stable as the price continues to rise and then people are going to want to save in that currency. Now, if you look at uh, other nations, you go look at Indonesia, you go look at uh, Egypt or India or uh, Kazakhstan or whatever. You know, th th these people have grown up knowing that their currency at some point is going to have a massive devaluation. And it's a way of life for them. So when they save... You know, they used to, uh, and they still do, they save in gold, right? That's where their savings are because they know that there's going to be a shock somewhere at some point and all their savings are going to go to shit. So what happens is the desire for that currency uh, goes out the window. Of course, they have to use it for everyday uh, means, but the desire to hold a Pakistani real is, is not there right? because they know there's going to be some kind of a devaluation. So having a digital currency... Um, it's just another way for somebody to save in these countries uh, with these uh, currencies that are constantly being devalued. Look at the Turkish lira. You want to hold tur Turkish lira? Uh, I don't think you want to save in Turkish lira. Uh, so, you know, there's definitely a desire and there's definitely uh, a use for savings, but not just for the 5%, but for the other 95%. Uh, you got to have some kind of fucking savings <laughs> and not just debt. Uh, and, and that's the problem that, that we're all facing. Uh, if you live in, in, in Ukraine, for example, people, they're not getting f free stimulus checks or whatever they call them. They don't get anything. They're like, fuck you. In fact, if you, wanna, if you want a vaccine, you got to pay for it. Same thing in Russia. You got to pay for the vaccine if you want it. Uh, think about that. So why can those economies sustain themselves while the U.S. and the West cannot? Right? It's because, again, they are, they're designed differently. Their purchasing habits, their culture, the way they behave is different than it is for us here in the U.S. 
where if we're not in the mall every single day buying something stupid, uh, we're in a great fucking recession. You know, <laughs> we're collapsing. So I guess what I'm trying to say is that, you know, in the U.S., we're so used to debt. It's just so normal for us, especially zero percent interest rates, you know, even though credit cards are like 15 percent, uh, that we don't know how to deal with these kind of shocks in the system. Uh, and you see countries like a U- a Ukraine or whatever, they're they're fully able to, to cope with this. Why? Because they they o- always prepare for the worst and they always have some kind of savings. So, you know, there's something to be said about savings. It's not just all bad. Uh, it's not all bad. Uh, and I think it's time that we start to realize that. Anyway, uh, let's just kind of, you know, we talked about the 10-year, we talked about Bitcoin, uh, the NASDAQ. Uh, let's look at Ethereum here, okay? That's that's about to break out to new all-time highs, okay? Uh, it's been battling the previous all-time high set back in 2018, and that looks like it's going to push higher. How about the dollar? Well, the dollar is in a really weird, funky kind of, um, I, I don't even know how to analyze it. Is it a W bottoming? That is going to start to rise because uh, people want to purchase U.S. bonds, or you know, is it this megaphone form? I, I I don't know what it's really doing. All I know, and I can tell you, is that it has broken down from this channel, and it's still below it. Okay. Uh, if you put the 63-day moving average here, okay. Uh, let me go to yeah, it's a daily. Okay. Close that. All right. That. You know, we're, we're starting to trade above the 63-day moving average. So there is a certain desire right now uh, to own dollars. Uh, it's f- it's been falling for quite a while now. It's starting to stabilize. Uh, I, I would venture to guess that once, uh, if price were to come down here, the 63-day moving, uh, moving average, it would start to uh, stabilize and perhaps start to rise again. Uh, we'll see how that goes. We'll see how that goes. Remember that when interest rates are rising, right, then you're going to attract foreign investment. Because do you want to own an Italian 10-year uh, for 0.66 or an American dollar, I'm sorry, American bond for 1.66, <laughs> right? It's common sense. It's, it's, not, it's not rocket science. Remember, always in the back of your mind, money chases yield, okay? Money chases yield. Just always keep that in the back of your mind. Uh, so some of the questions that I keep at, uh, people keep asking me is, you know, about the Dow, the all-time highs, and, and you know, where is money flowing and so forth. Remember the the money right now that's hot is uh, in saving, in value, quote unquote. Okay, so SVX, which is value, S and P, is outperforming the S and P. Okay, and it's broken out. It's pushing higher, um, and that's the place to be. What what about uh, financials versus SPY? Financials are up against this resistance area. Okay, uh, it's been falling for a very long time uh, since 2007, but now uh, financials are actually starting to outperform the S&P. Uh, how about uh, financials versus value? Well, financials have broken out above value. Okay, they, uh, there's more money going into financials than there, there are to uh, value. And when we're talking about value, we're talking about uh, Chevron, Exxon Mobil, Bank of America, uh, and so forth. And that's mostly due to uh, the spread between the 10 and the 2s. It doesn't matter where interest rates are. What does matter is the spread. Okay, the spread. This is where banks make all their money. They loan out at uh, the two-year uh, I'm sorry, they they pay out to savers on the two-year and loan out at the 10-year. So when the spread is high, okay, that's a that's a very profitable uh, position to be in for a bank. And now everybody wants to be a bank. Everybody wants to be a bank. Free money from the government. Uh, we had the same scenario back in 2008 after uh, QE uh, was implemented. And we're getting it uh, now as well. And this time it's been much, much, much more sharp than it was uh, back in 2008, which it was a more gradual. We didn't we didn't peak out until 2011. 2011. Uh, now we did it in, in a, uh, within a year. 
Now, as a, as a reminder, uh, I have relaunched bare knuckle charting, uh, and this is more focused towards stocks, not so much the macroeconomics. Uh, great setups, and uh, I've been posting uh, mostly for free uh, for you guys to follow along. Um, and you can come down for 9.95, and you can uh, see the uh, setups. Eventually, these are going to go away. They're not going to be free. Um, and um, you can, again, follow me on, on our trading view. You can follow here as well. Uh, and I'm going to start to uh, hide some of these uh, calls uh, and setups. Okay. So for anyway, for now, um, we're focused on value. Okay. Uh, so, you know, if you're if you're in the Dow, uh, I I don't know what to tell you other than hedge or sell out or, or whatever the case may be because Dow Jones right now is in a tear. Okay, uh, it is up against the resistance area, but if it starts to break through here, um, you know this thing can run quickly. And remember, this is all based on um, government deficits, right? And they're not going to go away anytime soon. Now, the question is going to be, are we in the last 50% of the stimulus or the first half of 50% of stimulus? And that's going to depend on the Green New Deal. Now they want to get rid of um, student debt. You know, next is going to be like free housing and then, it's, you know, God knows what. But that cat is out of the bag. But uh, we'll see. We'll see. We'll, we'll, you know, stay tuned and keep monitoring what's happening let's see how far the interest rates uh, continue to rise let's see how much commodities continue to rise don't think for one second that this is a, um, a stock market that is built on on the economy eventually it's going to correct there's no doubt in my mind that the, you know come to Jesus moment will come high flyers right now they're they're struggling um, you know the Tesla's the you know, whatever, the game stops, all this nonsense, you know, uh, we'll see how this is, you know, are these stocks going to start bringing down the rest of the market, or uh, is that why that money is flowing into value, that they'll lose less money when the market does correct? I, I don't know what the answer to that is, okay? Uh, but uh, rest assured that we talk about it every day uh, with my subscribers. So, again, um, Thank you for listening. Uh, don't forget to come down to patreon.com slash Rio Macro. Okay. And subscribe. All right, guys. Uh, I'll talk to you soon. Take care. Bye-bye.